love. I often ask couples that I marry, how do you explain love? And most people have difficulty doing that. I'm sure all of us would have some kind of difficulty trying to define love. And I think that's because when we're trying to define love, what we're trying to do is to to define God, because God is love. And maybe our brains are not quite big enough to describe God or to define God in any way. But over the last three months, we've been looking at this series called To Know Him is to Love Him. And uh, it's looking at the attributes of God. And today we're coming to the final one of these attributes. That does not mean that we now know everything there is to know about God. Uh, It's just a a very brief kind of introduction. We've looked at nine different attributes of God. Today is the tenth message in this series. And, uh, but I pray that as we've gone through that your desire for God has grown as you've come to understand who he is. And that the more that we get to know, the premise of this series was that if we can least understand who God is, at least get some kind of idea about what he is like, then at least what we can do is begin then to desire him more and become like him. So to know him is to love him. But I'm hoping that this series has just been the kind of starter for you, the appetizer, the entree for you to want to actually explore and to desire him and to know him even more. I think it was uh, A.W. Tozer who probably forgot more about God than I'll ever know who uh, made this statement. He says, I can no more do justice to the awesome and wonderful topic than a child can grasp a star. Still, by reaching towards the star, the child may call attention to it and even indicate the direction one must look to see it. And so I stretch my heart toward the high, shining love of God so that we may be encouraged to look up and hope. What a beautiful statement. So as we look up this morning, we learn that love is the supreme expression of God's personhood. And it flows out of his goodness. It affects every other attribute that we've been talking about. And if you take love out of the picture, none of the other attributes even make sense. Because when you think about it, the fact that God loves us is the very reason that we exist in the first place. His power is the how of creation, but his love is the why of creation. His power is the how but his love is the why. And love flows from him as the pure river of grace and mercy without detracting from anything or any of his holiness, any of his other attributes, any of his righteousness. And so as we understand and experience the love of God, we find that this this attribute of God is kind of a doorway into knowing God more intimately. To know him is to love him. And each of the topics that we've discussed over the, uh, the last few weeks, as I said, are fully expressed by God's love. For example, we talked about the fact that God is all-powerful. The word is omnipotent. Okay, just a test. Okay, there's a school teacher coming out now. It's God's absolute power, but God's absolute power is unleashed and motivated by his love on our behalf. His omniscient God or the omniscient God, his all-knowing ability. God knows all things. He knows everything there is to know about us and he still loves us the same way. The omnipresent God, we can count on God's love to be with us no matter where we are. He is with us in all places at all times. He loves us wherever we are. Our sovereign God, his control over all things is motivated by his love for us so that we can be lovingly submitted to his lordship in our life. The unchanging God who does not change in his love for us, we can be changed so that we can be changed from the inside out. God's love. A holy God, his holiness is linked to his love so that we can be overwhelmed by his majesty and drawn to his mercy and motivated by his love in mission. Our righteous God, 
expresses his love for us in his actions and so that we might be inspired to respond in love by righteous actions as well. And then last week we talked about that God is just, he's fair. He expresses his love for for us in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, perfectly balancing love and justice together. So what does the Bible say about love? In fact, it may not surprise you, but that love is mentioned a few times uh, in the Bible. In fact, in the New Testament, they use three different words that are used. In fact, there are a number of other words as well, but these ones are, are probably the most common. Eros is that romantic love. It's from where we get the word erotic from. It's that kind of romance you have, love for, for your spouse. Uh, phileo is a brotherly love. It's a love you have for friends. But the love that God has for us is agape love. And our culture today is focused on the first two of those, the eros and the phileo, but, but God's love is the deepest, it's the purest, it's this unconditional kind of love. And if you were to do a word search for the word love in the Bible, you'd come up with over 550 references. I'm not going to read them all to you this morning, okay? But I'm going to give you some of them that express the love of God. Just dwell on these just for a moment zephaniah three seventeen, the lord your god is with you he is mighty to save he will take great delight in you he will quiet you with his love he will rejoice over you with singing psalm 36 verse 7 how priceless is your unfailing love Isaiah 38, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, 1 John 3 verse 1, reminds me of custard on apple crumble. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. Now you're thinking about it, aren't you? that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. God's love lavished on us. Homemade custard. Psalm 63, verse 3. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. And of course, John three 16. I'm sure you've heard this one before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and we could go on and on and on and on listing the verses that talk about the love of God and we would still not understand it fully still not comprehend what he's done but without a doubt, this, this attribute of God is, is probably the most widely believed about God. In fact, even non-Christians believe that there is a, a God who loves. Well, in fact, they ask the question, don't they? If, if there's a loving God, why does he do this? If there's a loving God, why does he allow this to happen? But there's a common wrong, uh, sorry, common but wrong take on God's love as well because Here's the statement I hear in, in various forms from time to time. It just simply says, God's love means that everybody's going to go to heaven. Now, I want to say right up front, that's wrong. It's not true. But that's the kind of sense that we have. Many non-Christians have the idea that when you get to heaven, they're going to greet Jesus at the pearly gates, and he's going to say, wow, you've been a pretty good person. Come on in. <laughs> Welcome. And that's the heresy of what we call universalism, which sounds attractive that there is this God who's just going to welcome everybody into heaven regardless of what they've done, but it's at odds with the Scriptures. As we talked about last week, the fact that God is completely fair. He's laid out the pattern of behavior. He's laid out the way that it works, and he will be always just and fair. And only those who've put their complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be saved. 
So what is the love of God? How can we define it? Because human love is often a response to the conditions that we find ourselves in or the, the circumstances that we're in. And we love because someone pleases us in some way or we love because we find someone attractive or we love because somebody makes us laugh. But by contrast, God's love is not like that at all. God loves us because that's just the kind of God he is. It's just the kind of God he is. Nothing in him, uh, sorry, nothing in us causes him to love us. Matthew Henry said, the great God not only loves his saints, but he loves to love them. He loves to love. And one of the clearest passages in the New Testament is the one we're going to focus on this morning, on love, and it's found in Romans chapter 5. I will put it up onto the screen for you in just a moment, but you may want to follow in your own Bibles. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through to 10. And in these verses, Paul focuses on the death of Christ as the, as the supreme manifestation of God's love, the supreme example of the love of God. Here's what he says in Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? I think those last couple are a little bit different what I've read out. But we're going to break down this passage of scripture and we discover that there are four truths in here about who we are. Now remember, this is about the love of God for us. And the first thing we discover is that verse 6 says that we are powerless. Powerless. And to mean to, to say that we're powerless means that we can't change our basic nature on our own. We have nothing in us that has any ability to change our basic nature. The, the word in the New Testament is often used to describe the sick and the feeble to those who've been wiped out by some kind of disease. They are powerless to actually do anything about themselves. It's kind of this picture of you know, somebody drowning and trying to rescue themselves by pulling themselves up by their hair. Anyway, this, some of you might have better chance than I do. Okay? It's also used in the term of some kind of moral sense to denote an inability with regard to any kind of duty. And specifically, it means that we have no plan or no power to come up with a plan to justify our own selves. We have nothing in us that can deal with the basic nature that we have. Left to our own, uh, to our own devices, none of us is able to do even one thing that is able to please God or to achieve salvation. We are completely powerless that's what we were like and then in verse 6 he talks about ungodly it means that we have no desire to change in the first place so not only do we have no ability to actually change our lives we actually have no desire to change our lives we're not only helpless but we're also vile and obnoxious the word ungodly indicates that we're both irreverent and impious and have deliberately withheld from God what is rightfully his. We are ungodly. So there's no ability for us to actually do anything about changing our lives, but also no desire in us to even want to change our lives. The third truth is found in verse 8. It says that we are sinners, meaning that we are desperately in need of change that we can't make and we don't want to make. We are desperately in need of a change that we can't make and we don't want to make. We are neither righteous nor good 
when Christ died for us. We had totally missed the mark. And then if you jump across to verse 10, the fourth phrase is even stronger. It says that we were enemies of God. Because of our powerlessness, because of our ungodliness, because of our sinning ways, we were considered not friends of God, but enemies of God. Not, which, by the way, is not a very popular kind of teaching today, especially when we're focusing on God's love. But Ephesians 2 verse 3 adds to this that says that we were by nature objects of God's wrath. We're his enemies. And the truth of the matter is that we have willfully rebelled against God's commands. We've broken his moral laws. We've acted in total defiance of his known will for us. And you may wonder why are we talking about God's love and then talking about our condition? Why are we focusing on that? Because here's why. That's what the Bible teaches and it helps us to see God's depth of love for us because if that's the state that we were in and God demonstrated his love for us while we were still in that kind of state as powerless, ungodly sinners and enemies of God, and it helps us to see that we have no claim on God's love. We can't say we deserve it. We can't say that we've earned it in any way. Sin has so infected our lives that it has distorted even the things that we think are a kind of beautiful. Here's what sin does. And I don't know whether this is a word or not, but I'm going to use it. It uglifies everything it touches. By the way, it is a word. Okay, I checked. <laughs> It uglifies. Isn't that a great word? <laughs> See, here's the thing this morning. There is no reason for God to love us. There is no reason for him to do that except this. That's the kind of God he is. God is love. And he loves us because God is love and he can't help loving us even when we're his enemies. His love is greater than our sin and he loves us in spite of our sin. And by the way, if you find all this a little bit discouraging this morning, remember this, if God loved you only when you're lovable, when you stop being lovable, that means God would stop loving you. God loves us in spite of our unloveliness. God loves us even despite the fact that we were powerless to do anything about ourselves. We were, in fact, we have no desire to do anything about it. Not only that, we act in ways that are ungodly and more than that, we are enemies of God. And we can count on God's love because it doesn't depend upon us. So I want to talk to you this morning about God's unconditional love because this passage of scripture describes what God has done given the state that we were in and the first thing it tells us is this that he went far beyond what we would do if you look at verse 7 in Romans chapter 5 it says this very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die and as I thought about that passage, I, I thought, I wondered how many people I would be willing to die for. You're thinking as the pastor, it would be for everybody here, wouldn't it? Sorry. <laughs> In reality, there's probably just a handful. And some would be higher priority than others, all right? You'd have to work out where you're at. Okay. And probably that's true for all of us, you know, that each of us would have a handful of people that we would say, you know, I'd give my life for that person. And generally they're people that are, you know, kind of related to us in some ways. We're probably, but certainly not for a bunch of people, especially those that we don't know. Especially for those who are our enemies. And this verse is telling me that God's love for us is not like my love. God's love is not like that. You've heard of pe examples of people, I'm sure, you know, in war times where people have dived on a grenade, for example, to protect people around them. Uh, 
But God's love is even more great, even greater than that. God went far beyond what we would do. We would never, ever think of doing what God did for us. So he did what we would never do. God demonstrates his own love for this. Here's what he did, verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the emphasis in that verse is on the word sinners. It wasn't while we were his friends. It wasn't while we had our lives all together, God decided he was going to kind of bless us on top of that with the, you know, the custard on the top. <laughs> he did it while we were still sinners. And the wonder is not that Christ should die for us. The wonder is that he would die for us while we were still his enemies while we were still in rebellion against him. He didn't die for his friends. He didn't die, sorry, he, he didn't die for his friends. He died for his enemies. He died for those who crucified him. He died for you and I while we were still his enemies. And if you're ever tempted to doubt the love of God, just go back to the cross. If you ever wondered whether God really loves you, <laughs> just go back to the cross. Because on the cross, he demonstrated his love for us. And think about it this way. If God loved me enough to give his son to die for me while I was still in rebellion against him, surely he loves me enough to care for me now while I'm his child. If his love was so great that he would do that while I was his enemy, surely now as a child of God, his love is even greater. Having given such a priceless gift of his son, he will most definitely give all that is consistent with his glory and my good. And let me just add an aside here this morning that I touched on last week. I shared with you that God is just and he must, because that's his nature and character, punish sin and always act in a fair, a fair way. And sometimes we think of God's unconditional love as something that means he'll not punish our wrongdoing. He could never send people to hell because he's a loving God. I want you to get that thought right out of your head this morning. Because it's God's love, unconditional love, that actually means that he must punish sin. He must discipline us because he perfectly balances love and justice in the cross. God's love for us means that he cannot simply live, allow us to live in disobedience. He must punish sin, but remember he has provided a way for his love and justice to mesh perfectly in Jesus Christ. And that's through faith in Jesus alone. That's what God did. And that's how much he loves us. This series, by the way, friends, has always been about what's our response to the attributes of God. It's not just getting to know who God is. It's about how we respond to him. You know, biblical love always leads to action. Love is always complete alone. It requires some kind of commitment, some kind of movement. It's impossible to say that you love someone without demonstrating that love in tangible ways. And God loves you so much that he was moved to action. He did something on your behalf. John 3.16 tells us that. For God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave. Love always gives. Lust always takes, by the way. Lust is all about getting what I want, getting something that meets my needs. Love always gives. Love always gives. So our response to the love of God, if we want to love God in return, that means we have to actually move towards him in some way. Here's the first thing I want to share with you. I'm going to leave, give you six of them fairly quickly this morning as we wrap up. In response to God's love, we ought to love him wholeheartedly. Matthew 22 says this, 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. He says this is the first and the greatest commandment. Because of God's love for us, our response to God's love is that we ought to love him with every ounce of our being. The Bible makes it very clear, if we say that we love God, then we'd better put him first by obeying him. Obedience. Secondly, because of God's love for us, we ought to love others. 1 John 4.11 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And our love for God should lead us to actually love others around us as well. Those who've been created in his image, those who are objects of his affection. And that involves serving one another, serving those that we claim to love. Husbands, are you serving your wives and loving them as Christ loved the church? Wives, are you looking for ways to put your husband first? Do you love your kids unconditionally, regardless of how they behave? Teenagers, do you love and honour your parents? Do you love your co-workers and your neighbours the same way that Christ loves us? Our response to God's love is to love others. Thirdly, we need to love ourselves. Matthew 22, 39 says, The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself god loves you and accepts you the way that you are and there's no reason to dislike yourself when the creator has demonstrated his love by sending his son to die on a cross for you you are complete and have tremendous value and breathtaking dignity as a child of god you matter to the almighty he loves you And on the authority of the Bible, you need to know that God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He's demonstrated that. Or in the words of Bill Hybels, you matter more to God than you will ever know. Or in my own words, he's crazy about you, even if you're an old goat. He loves you. Number four. It gets tougher, by the way. In response to God's love, we need to love our enemies. Matthew 5, 44, I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. I wonder, is there anybody at work, in your neighbourhood, anyone in your school, in your university class, that you consider an enemy? The Bible is clear that we are called to unconditional love. And just as Christ loved us when we're at war with him, we too are to love our enemies. It's not easy. When you've been damaged and hurt by somebody, but in response to the love of God, remember while we were still his enemies, God demonstrated his love for us. Number five, love compels us to tell others. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 20 says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And because we have been recipients of the love of God, it ought to flow out to love God. For others to tell others about that that's why we partner with missionaries that's why we look for creative ways to communicate the love of god to this community here that's why we have our building down there that's ready to go so that we can actually show the love of god to the community that we live and i don't know if you've ever been so moved by the love of god that you just can't help tell other people about jesus if not Don't try to fire yourself up with becoming more evangelistic. Take yourself deeper into God. Spend some time in an intimate relationship with God. It was Joe Aldridge. I think he, he, I can't remember the book that he wrote on, on evangelism, but he said, evangelism is what spills over when we bump into someone. 
Evangelism is what spills over when we bump into somebody. So allow God to fill you up to the brim that as you bump into people during the week, God's love is flowing into their lives as well. And finally, love calls people to salvation. In the passage from Romans 5, we looked at earlier, the word for, F-O-R, is used four times. Okay? And that meaning is so broad, but it, the English word actually doesn't kind of summarize it real well. But here's how it should be translated. It's for the benefit of, or on behalf of, or instead of. And when the Bible says that Jesus died for you, it means that he died on your behalf. He died for in your place so you can enjoy all the benefits of being with him. So if I paraphrase Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love from this. While we were still sinners, Christ died instead of us for our benefit and on our behalf. That's what he did. Our loving God. God is love. I think one of the greatest passages of scripture that I see if it talks about the, the love of God is found in 1 Corinthians 13. It's often read at weddings. I'm going to read just verses 4 to 8 for you this morning. And as I do, I want you to consider this truth. God is love. So as I read the passage, every time I mention the word love, I want you in your mind to replace it with the word God. Okay? So you don't have to say it out loud, but just to be able to imagine as I read through this, every time I mention love, replace it with the word God. What I'd like you to do is just close your eyes for a moment as we read it. Here we go. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Open your eyes. God is love. God is love. And that's great. But love is one of the moral attributes of God. For those who've been a part of this series understand that there are non-moral attributes and moral attributes. Non-moral attributes are those which belong to God alone. He alone is all-powerful, all-knowing. He alone is, is able to be in all places at once. But there are some moral attributes of God that he calls us to emulate that God is holy, therefore we are to be holy. God is righteous, therefore we are to be righteous. God is just, therefore we are to be just, even if it's a lesser means of that. God is love, therefore we are to emulate his love. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read that passage again. I'm going to do it exactly the same, except this time, instead of replacing love with God, I want you to do this. I want you to put your name there. Okay? Every time I mention the word love, put your name. And let the Holy Spirit convict you and challenge you and start to transform you into the likeness of his son. Close your eyes again. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. 
love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Open your eyes. How was that? (laughs) I wonder if you, like me, are a little convicted by some of those statements. Gary is patient. Gary is kind. It's easy to put somebody else's name there, isn't it? (laughs) But if you're challenged by that little exercise... And we want to be like God, remember. We want to emulate him. We want to reflect who he is. We want to take the time to to become more and more like him. To know him is to love him. Then if the Holy Spirit has touched you this morning and said, you know, Gary, there's some things in your life that they don't measure up. That's not quite true when it says that Gary keeps no record of wrongs or Gary is patient or... Put your name there instead of Gary, by the way. Just, okay. Then I think you need to do some business with God this morning. We need to come into his presence in a way so that he can do a work in us and transform us in the inside and make us more like him. I invite our worship team, if you could come on up, please. But if there were some things that you were uncomfortable about saying in your mind with that, then maybe talk to the Lord about it this morning. At the end of our service, our prayer team will be over here during the singing of this last song. You may want to come forward and we'll have some people here ready to pray for you and to pray with you and to encourage you in that. But in reality, the end of this series is just the start of getting to know God and spending time in his presence. So starting to become more and more like him. You won't know him until you've received the gift of salvation, by the way. (laughs) Because maybe there are some here this morning who've never, ever responded to what God did on the cross, demonstrating his love. You can't earn God's love because it's not for sale. Nothing we can do can make God love us any more than he already does and nothing we can do can ever make him love us any less. And if you've never accepted the love of God, demonstrated in Christ Jesus, then maybe today's the day to be able to do that. We're going to finish with a song that's been around for a little while by Jeff Bullock called The Power of Your Love. God's love is powerful. It transforms lives, changes lives. And it's love that was demonstrated in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. I invite you to respond to him this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, it's easy for us just to go through the motions. Father, would you forgive us for not loving you and not loving others the way that you want us to? Lord, I'm challenged by some of those statements in my own life. And I know there are many here who will be the same. Would you make us like you today? Would you make us, Father, into the nature of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we respond to you in love? In Jesus' name.